Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 19th of May 2014 in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session five, part one. Well, welcome again to our Frequently Asked Questions channel and uh, this Frequently Asked Questions series is about emotions and feelings. We're up to session five now, so we've been going for some time answering different questions. And because we're only getting to do like 10 to 20 questions every session, um, we will be going for some time more on the, <laughs> the question or series of emotions because we have uh, quite a few hundreds of questions uh, relating to emotions and emotional processing and other questions like, uh, related to those particular things. So we would like to recommend before you watch the answers to these particular questions that you still have a look at, if you have not done so, the human soul frequently asked questions up to session three and also session two of this, emotion, this emotions and feelings playlist because session two uh, answers many ba very basic questions about emotions. But uh, Mary's joined me today. She's going to be asking the questions from our listeners and, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> I so, feel pretty confident that it will. <laughs> so we'll, we enjoy your company and, uh, and I hope you enjoy getting these answers as well. Thanks very much for your time. <laughs> our first question today is from Amanda mm -hmm. and she asks, is dealing with fear a major way or the way for developing trust in God and confirming the goodness of God's character, as opposed to our parents' character and behaviour around fear? Mm. This is an interesting question because I feel there's so many things that we could talk about as a result of the question. Yep. Firstly, is fear the major way we can confirm God's character? I don't believe so, no, in, in terms of dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. um, Dealing, dealing with fear does help us a lot to determine God's character, though, but there are many other ways we can also determine God's character. And the major way we determine God's character is by receiving love from God, and then we get a feeling about what God's character really is. Fear, obviously, is the preventing op operation of the soul that prevents us from receiving God's love. Yeah. And so, therefore, we do need to address fear if we're ever going to receive God's love. Now, she brings up an interesting thing about a parent's emotions, because if you think about all of the hurtful damage that parents have done to children, it's all based around fear. So, of course, when we process through or we release from our experience fear, then we can see very clearly a person who is afraid and their motivations and a person who is not afraid and their motivations. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, God is not afraid. So therefore, God, does not have any, God doesn't have any fear and has never projected fear onto the planet. And none of our causal emotions are really related to God. They're related to humans' viewpoint of God yep. with regard to our relationship with God. And all of that is related to fear as well. And that is a lot about, again, our parents' fear. So it is very true that if we allow ourselves to experience fear, and we allow ourselves to go through the emotional process of experiencing fear, then what will happen is that we will see clearly that God, logically and also from our feeling-based relationship with God, we'll be able to determine that God is not a fear person, not a, a, an entity that's based around fear, yeah. and, uh, and that God is only love. And we will then come to trust that much more easily because we can feel that God is never motivated by fear in anything that God does. Mm -hmm. Whereas with our parents, most of our mistrust with our parents began with the fact that they were motivated by fear under certain circumstances. So there were times when they loved us and then when they were motivated by fear, generally they did not love us. And in fact, it's impossible to love while you're motivated by fear. So every single time they were motivated by fear, they didn't love us. And what we got to see was that fear became the dominant aspect of their personality and nature and the fact that in the sense that it, it was used as a tool mm -hmm. to justify their unloving behaviour towards ourselves. So their avoidance of fear in that case. Their avoidance of fear, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you could say they're honouring fear as their God mm -hmm. caused them to choose fear over love. Yeah. And that caused a lot of hurtful damage to their children, of yeah. which we are some. Yeah. And now, 
Now, once we have that damage and we receive that damage, we start to mistrust our parents. And we learn to mistrust our parents because we know that every time our parents act in harmony with fear, they become untrustworthy, mm -hmm. right? Just like anybody who acts in fear becomes untrustworthy. And in fact, it is impossible to trust, to fully trust a person who acts in harmony with fear. So any person who lives in fear and who acts in harmony with fear will always at some point act out of harmony with truth and love. Yeah. And so they become very untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, God never does those things. And so once we've felt through the experiences of our own past fears that we haven't released, we start to see that God is trustworthy. We can always trust God because God never acts in harmony with fear yeah. or, or, or has fear as his God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but rather, God always acts in harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we know we can always trust that person. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting what I find on earth with regard to trust. A lot of people trust people, other people, who are totally untrustworthy because they honour fear. Any person who honours fear at any level is untrustworthy. Yeah. You can't trust them. You can't. As soon as they honour truth and do not honour fear, now you can trust them. Mm -hmm. So trust is built by, per, by, the, by observing that the person is always acting in harmony with truth and love. True trust, that is. Yeah. But I find it interesting on earth that a lot of people do not analyse trust in that regard. They believe they can trust their family members when their family members have actually proven themselves untrustly, untrustworthy by proving that they are going to operate in fear at some point. Mm -hmm. So they have proven themselves untrustworthy. And it's pointless trusting a person who's already proved themselves to be untrustworthy. Yeah. So if we were truly focused upon um, understanding the relationship between fear and trust, we would see that any person who is in harmony with fear and acting in harmony with fear is always going to be untrustworthy mm -hmm. and we cannot trust them. And God is not a person who acts in harmony with fear ever yeah. and so therefore is always trustworthy. Yeah. But we will not feel that until we've worked through our own fear. So Amanda, Amanda's um, question is really hitting on something important then mm -hmm. in, in that she's highlighting that when we live in fear, we have an inherent mistrust of God mm -hmm. because... And we trust people who actually are untrustworthy. We do both. Yes. Mm. And why do we, why do, we do that um, second thing? Well, mostly because we've been taught to do so. We've been taught that there are some things that our parents are allowed to get away with, even though they felt at the time to be very unloving towards ourselves, yep. we, we are taught that that's normal. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if a parent's afraid for our life, then it's okay for them to hit us. Yeah. That's what we're taught. Yeah. Now, God doesn't hit us on any occasion, even when God observes our life. And God's not afraid of our life because God created an eternal existence. Yeah. So God's never afraid of us dying yeah. and therefore will never, you know, use violence as a method of preventing our death. So, you know, we see a very, very different viewpoint from God versus our parents. Mm -hmm. But we've been brought up with parents who justify the use of fear mm -hmm. and who then call it love. And so we now have a very distorted viewpoint within us of fear versus love, fear versus truth. And, and because of these distortions, and as we've talked about before, these distortions are a major cause of our emotional difficulties. Yeah. So because of these distortions, the majority of people on earth are very confused when it comes to love. Mm -hmm. And also they do believe that fear and love can exist side by side. Yeah, and they cannot. Yeah. 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 So basically you're saying that we've been taught to believe that the way our parents behave is love. And yet we have an inherent mistrust of that because they have often been acting in fear. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and when people act in fear, they're not consistent and they often react in an unloving way. Mm -hmm. But as a child, we can't really comprehend the difference. Well, I do believe as a child we can comprehend the difference. Mm -hmm. Like when we connect with the childlike feelings inside of us about our parents' treatment of ourselves, most of the time we will be able to actually feel the fact that we couldn't trust our parents to actually not be violent. We couldn't yes. trust our parents to not somehow manipulate us emotionally. We couldn't trust our parents to act in harmony with love under all circumstances. 
We, we do feel those feelings, but we suppress them. We suppress them because we're invested in avoiding the pain of that experience. Correct. And, you know, as we've discussed in the sessions about how the human soul functions, every time we want to avoid pain, we will revert to suppressive techniques, mm -hmm. which are all about our addiction. So we enter addictions with people in order to prevent our fear. Yeah. And the majority of us have entered addictions even with our parents. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our addiction response to our parents is a direct response to their addictions with us. Yeah. And we often have entered into addictions with our parents. And then of course, whenever those parents didn't meet those addictions, we then sought another person to do so. Mm -hmm. So many of us are in, currently in a relationship with another person, a partnership relationship, where we're actually getting most of our addictions met and, uh, and this makes us feel quite happy, but the reality is that we're not really happy. We've still got all of these emotions inside of us and fear is still quite dominant in our lives. Still governing everything. And then so that constitutes a major block towards God because we, we don't, just as we have a sense that what happened in our childhood from our parents was not loving mm -hmm. and we're afraid to, to really... Um, explore that and release that, mm -hmm. then that gets projected upon God. We think, can mm. we really trust this person that we can't even see? Mm. And so... But it makes a, doesn't make much a logical sense if you think about it. For example, it makes a lot more logical sense to, to see that God must be far better than any human mm -hmm. and therefore far more loving than any human. And it, therefore it's a very illogical for us to attribute to God emotions that we feel about our parents. But most of the time we do that to avoid the emotions that we feel about our parents. Yeah. In other words, we go, no, our parents loved us. It's God that didn't love us. Yes. Rather than going, no, that's actually <laughs> incorrect. It's our parents who didn't love us and God has loved us all of this time. Yeah. And it's just that we now feel that that's not true because of our parents' projections and other fear-based emotions that they've had causing us now to live in our own fear. Mm. So, the, so yes, the answer to Amanda's question is yes. If you feel your fear and experience it and go through it and come out the other side of your fear, you will have a very, very good uh, opinion of God. Yeah. You'll also have a very accurate opinion of your family and your, and your parents, but it won't be a, necessarily a good opinion. Yeah. It'll be an accurate opinion in the sense that you'll know when you'll know under what circumstances they are willing to compromise love. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with my father, I know that he on earth, my father on earth, I know that he will compromise love whenever his religious beliefs are confronted. Yeah. So, in other words, whenever he gets confronted from his belief systems, he will always sacrifice love. I know that mm -hmm. from his behaviour with me. And I've known that for a long time. I know that he does it with other emotions too. And I know with my mum, whenever she's confronted by fear, she will always withdraw love. Yep. She will always go back into her shell. She will always not be loving to, an, to another person, including myself. So I know whatever issues she's afraid of, she can't love me. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you know that, you know what bits of the person you can trust and what bits of the person are not trustworthy. Yeah. Because any time their fear is triggered, they become not trustworthy if they honour their fear over truth. And God doesn't have fear, so God always is truthful, and so therefore God is always trustworthy. Yeah. And any person on earth who, the persons on earth who are the most trustworthy are those who have the least fear. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yeah. obviously there's very few of those. Very few, because mm. even people who are present the facade of being quite fearless mm -hmm. are often full, full of, fear, of fear. Full of fear. And yeah. particularly emotional fear. Yeah. So they might present a bravado, particularly with physical things that they're not afraid of. Mm -hmm. But emotionally, they're often full of fear. Yeah. And when it comes to relationships, you see them act out these fears. You see the toughest of men not wanting to open their hearts to their wives. Yeah. So that shows you that they're very, very closed emotionally and therefore very afraid yep. of opening their hearts to the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So so you know that fear under those circumstances will trigger their actions. Mm -hmm. Put them in a certain circumstance and they'll act a certain way and they are, it's not possible for them to love you while that fear exists within them. Yeah. 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 With God, it's always possible for God to love us because no fear exists mm. in God. Mm. Mm. And working through our fear 
specifically with our parents, is going to open our hearts up to receiving that truth. Yes, and, and probably be more accurate to say working through our fear about any subject <laughs> will open our hearts more to the truth about God's nature. Mm -hmm. When we are full of fear ourselves, we, we, are become, we become afraid of a punishing God yeah. and we become afraid of a God that doesn't exist actually. So in other words, we, we basically believe that God's a certain way when God isn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and obviously that is going to cause a distortion and uh, in our relationship with God and make, it, and make a relationship with God very, very difficult. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank mm. you. Our next question is on the topic of shame. Mm -hmm. It says, professional opinions vary about what constitutes or defines shame. Renee Brown proposes that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Mm. And this comes from her book, I Thought It Was Just Me, chapter one, page five. Mm -hmm. How would you define shame and what's God's view of shame? Well, I, I have a lot of difficulty with the common psychologist view of shame mm -hmm. because shame is not a causal emotion, it's an effect emotion. And because it's an effect, effect emotion, it's the result of us not feeling certain pain. So, so her definition is shame is the result. Uh, what, what did she say? Shame is the result it's of... It's an intensely painful feeling, feeling or, or experience of believing we are flawed. Yeah. Um, while I agree that we do often believe we are flawed mm -hmm. and that we often feel shame as a result of believing that we are flawed, the shame, the shame itself and believing we are flawed is an effect emotion. Yeah. It's not a cause. The causal emotion is usually something far worse, mm -hmm. and that is that we've been attacked and berated and belittled and humiliated generally by our environment and a lot of times by our parents. Mm -hmm. And of course, we then grow up believing that that you know we are flawed so as a result. It's sort of like something causally happened, something um, very bad and painful where externally there was a projection upon us that we were bad in that moment yes. or over an extended period. Yes. That's the causal feeling and then the shame And our is fear of feeling that feeling creates, creates shame. Which is like a global feeling, I am bad yes. all the time. Yes. Yep. So fear is actually the major cause of shame or yep. not wanting to feel your fear is a major cause of shame. Now, here we've got to differentiate between shame and what I would call proper guilt. Mm -hmm. Now, they are not the same thing. Proper guilt is the kind of guilt you experience when you know you've done something out of harmony with love and you feel bad about it. And proper guilt is a, is a precursor to repentance, which is a process that we need to go through, it, during which we may feel ashamed of ourselves, mm -hmm. and properly so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once we allow ourselves to feel the shame of having taken actions that are unloving, and we work through the actual reasons why we took such actions, we'll come out the other end no longer feeling ashamed and no longer feeling bad about our actions, although we do recognise the actions are wrong and we would never repeat them because we've gone through an emotional process which, meant it, which was so painful that we do not want to repeat the emotional process. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we never repeat the action. Now, that kind of guilt which motivates repentance is actually a proper and the shame associated with that guilt is proper emotion that we need to experience and is causal emotion actually. Mm -hmm. But it's emotion caused by our unloving actions and coming to, and those unloving actions coming to scar our conscience and, and then pressure our conscience into operation, mm -hmm. which we then recognise we've done something out of harmony with love. And once we've recognised that, we then take actions. And one of those actions includes feeling some shame about our action, yeah. uh, about what we chose to do that was out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I would call proper guilt with subsequent emotions of shame involved, yeah. which is a direct result of our unloving choices as a person. And those choices have caused damage to our soul that we need to experience the pain of. And in fact, the majority of our pain in our soul is actually related to that. Yeah. It's not the minority, it's the majority of our pain is related to... It's related to the, the unloving, unloving choices. choices we've made yes. as adults. Yes. Out of harmony with love. Yes. And, yeah. and not just as adults. 
we often made unloving choices as a child, mm-hmm. and, but those choices are not directly attributable to us 100% of the time because partly our environment contributed to that unloving choice generally. But, but we are capable as children of making loving choices. You know, this is something we need to teach our children, that yes. every child, even by the age of three, four or five, is capable of making loving choices all the time. That's the reality. If they had no fear, they would make loving choices all the time, most probably. And, and we can't just say that the fear is the cause of the unloving choice either, because there are many people who have, you know, not, not fear as the primary motivator for an unloving choice, but, the desire, or, but, but rather anger or some other emotion, mm-hmm. and even sometimes just desire causes them to make an unloving choice that yeah. they later regret. Now, that's different to what I believe uh, Brené Brown is talking about here with regard to shame. Yeah. To me, what she's discussing in her book is the effect emotion mm-hmm. of other behaviour which is causal, which is the terrible treatment that we've received at the hands of our environment, mm-hmm. usually our parents. Mm-hmm. And this treatment included shaming us, belittling us, humiliating us, and other actions that are taken right the way to violent actions and other actions too that often are sexually abusive, have been taken towards us in the justification of the parent not wanting to feel their fear Mm -hmm. and not wanting to feel their pain. Mm -hmm. Now, now I would say that then of all of that, shame is the subsequent result or the effect of of these actions. However, feeling shame will not stop these these actions from being cured. In other words... Um, The causal emotion relating to shame has to be felt, Mm -hmm. not the shame itself. Mm -hmm. So every person that goes through feeling shame every day will find that they will not release the causal emotion of their shame because shame is an effect emotion. And in a sense, they're retelling themselves the the negative message rather than connecting to the pain of the negative message being given to them. Yes, there's the pain of the negative message that we must feel, mm-hmm. but we, to, to feel the pain of the negative message, we have to acknowledge the truth, that we mm-hmm. were treated badly, mm-hmm. and most people don't want to do that. Yeah. And so what they do is they prefer to feel shame, mm-hmm. they f- prefer to treat themselves badly or feel that they are bad mm-hmm. to the core, rather than feel that their parents treated them badly and, and, and that the responsibility for this poor treatment rests upon the parent and not upon the child. Mm-hmm. We want to tell ourselves that it's our fault rather than telling ourselves that it's our parents' fault that we got treated badly. That's what we want to do. And so when we do that, we are drawn towards self-punishment and we're also drawn towards shame as an emotion to feel. Once you realise that your parents treated you badly and you start going through those emotions of how bad the treatment was, it's very rare for a person to feel shame after that point. Yep. They, 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 in fact, get through their shame very rapidly as a result of seeing the truth. And the truth is you didn't deserve this treatment. No matter what kind of a child you were, mm-hmm. you never deserved this treatment that your parents and your environment dished out to you that caused your underlying feelings of shame. So shame is an effect emotion. Therefore, it is not a causal emotion. Yeah. Therefore, feeling shame is not going to release a causal emotion. Mm-hmm. It is only going to release or, or make us live in the effect of what was done to us causally. So we can feel shame every day for 10 years, and at the end of the day, we'll probably still feel ashamed. Yeah. It's only when we start facing the cause of the shame yeah. emotionally that we will release the underlying feeling of the effect. Mm-hmm. So... so so the feeling of the causal feeling is related to the abusive treatment by parents and the general treatment by parents that people on earth don't classify as abusive. I do classify yeah. as abusive. Yeah. The majority of parents have abused their child in some way. As a child, we learnt to feel some shame about it. We learnt to feel that it was our fault. Yeah. In fact, most of the time the parents said to us it was our fault, actually, mm-hmm. verbally said to us mm-hmm. that it was our fault. Quite often somebody, like I remember my father smacking me once and saying, this is your fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to do this, but I must do it because God tells me I've got to do it. Yeah. Right? You know, that's telling me that it's my fault, yeah. that, he's, that he's belting me. In other words, that he's being violent towards me. Now, every child pretty much of my generation, anyway, I'm 50, in my 50s, but pretty much any child in my generation 
has felt that and has probably been told that. Yeah. That's the reality. And so we've been told all of these distortion-based messages about love yeah. and, and we've been told that it's our fault that violence was perpetrated towards us. Mm -hmm. Once we go through the truth of that and we realise the truth that it wasn't our fault, that it was our parents' unfelt emotions and their addictions to not feeling their own emotions that caused them to take actions like that, then we are now honouring the truth and once we start honouring the truth, we start feeling the actual pain of a parent who projects their rage at us. Yeah. And that's the real causal pain underneath the feeling of shame, yeah. which is the effect of the pain. Yeah, because the shame is an untruth, isn't it, that yes. we're telling ourselves? Correct. Uh, and if you feel it over and over again emotionally, what you're doing is you're telling yourself over and over again emotionally that you, are, you should be ashamed of yourself all mm -hmm. the time. And the reality is that doesn't get you anywhere, mm -hmm. as most people who have ever tried it know. Right? You will not get anywhere unless you face the truth about how this shame entered you, how the actual effect of shame came upon you, mm -hmm. which is all about the causal emotions relating to the parent's treatment of you. That's how this shame entered you. Now, it might not be just the parents. Like if we went to school at the age of five and we went to a boarding school at the age of five, for example, then from the five to 12, probably a lot of shame come from external yeah. factors at the boarding school. Yeah. It might not have come from your parents. Yeah. So it, it would be more accurate to say this shame came from the treatment of your external environment, whoever was involved in your external environment, or it's the effect of your own bad choices. Mm -hmm. The key for you is to determine which one is which. Yes. Why, which uh, am I dealing here with something that I need to deal with, which is related to my own bad choices, or is have I just been told I'm making bad choices when I haven't made bad choices at all and it's just other people making, perpetrating bad choices towards me? Mm. Which one was it? Mm -hmm. And if it's the f f second one, the perpetration of bad choices by other people towards you, that has caused this shame, then shame is not the emotion you need to feel. Yeah. If you really want to be released from it, you need to feel what they did to you. Mm -hmm. You need to feel about those things. If it's related to the feeling of guilt associated with unloving things you chose to do, then yes, you do need to feel some shame about that, yeah. which is a part of the penalties of the soul that, that automatically the soul engages with the law of compensation, mm -hmm. which is a law that operates upon the soul whenever we choose to do something out of harmony with love, and it causes pain within the soul that must be felt. And part of that pain is shame. Yeah. And we need to feel that particular emotion. Now, that is a causal emotion, whereas the other ones I've been talking about, which is the primary experience, experience of shame that most people on this planet have, is not the actual emotion. It's not a causal emotion that we need to feel. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, the question revolved around from memory. How uh, you would define shame. How I would define shame. Well, I think I've descri de described how God's view of shame. There are some things for which we should be ashamed, which are uh, to do with things that we've done that are out of harmony with love that we need to take action about. Yeah. Now, shame wouldn't mean we live in the shame of it. We would take action about, about it. Yeah. Right? So there's one, that's one. And then the other is the effect of bad treatment to, perpetrated towards us, which is the primary cause of shame on this planet, and that is not a causal emotion. Mm. It is an effect emotion based around not wanting to come to terms with some of the reasons for how it was caused, which are all revolving around how our environment treated us during our childhood years. It, it sounds to me in the first instance you're talking about where shame comes up through a process of repentance. Yep that sounds like the shame that we experience in that state is um, powerful and transient when we're going. It's, a, it's an emotion that moves through us that enables the process of repentance. It enables the process of repentance, but it also moves us into action to repair the damage we did. Yes. That's the motivation. Yep. It causes us to go, oh, I can't live with the, me having done that. I now need to try or attempt to fix this somehow. Mm -hmm. And that is the motivation that we have that is motivated by some of the shame. Now, now, obviously, if we don't feel the shame, we'll be running around for the rest of our lives trying to fix something that we fixed years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah. So if we don't release, if we if don't, we don't experience release it, it yeah. we gotcha. need to experience it to release it. 
and, and, uh, and understand the underlying motivations and why we did what we did. Mm -hmm. So even that shame is not causal in the, its an emotional yes. state. It's really related around the underlying thing that we chose to do something wrong purposefully, mm -hmm. right? And we want to find the reason why we did. Yeah. And shame isn't the reason why we did. It's just the tug on us to look at why. Exactly. Yeah. It's the tug on us to look at why. It's the guilt that drives us to look at why we did something. Whereas the other shame, yeah. right, is, is actually just the effect, the complete effect of somebody treating us badly. Yeah. So I'd like to talk about the second thing in a mm -hmm. minute. Mm -hmm. But you said uh, something where you said shame and guilt are almost the same in this first process of repentance. Yes, in the, in the guilt and shame yep. there are emotions we need to allow to pass through us. If we hold on to them, which most people do, they will drive the rest of our lives. Yep. Right? So, so they are effects as well of deeper causes. Right? But they are related to the process of repentance. Without guilt and shame, it's highly unlikely we'd have noticed that we did anything wrong. And under those circumstances, we're probably not going to be motivated to examine the reason why we did something wrong. Yeah. So God has made it in such a way that this, the, the guilt and shame are compensatory effects upon our soul, painful mm -hmm. effects upon our soul, that when we take an action that's out of harmony with love, there's guilt and shame that's created inside of the soul that needs to be felt and released so that we eventually are motivated to find out why we chose to do such things. Sure. Mm -hmm. Could you differentiate between how you define guilt and how you define shame? Yes, to me, shame is a very, um, a, a fairly self-absorbed emotion, I uh -huh. suppose you could say, uh -huh. in the sense that we feel really bad within ourselves that we chose to do such a thing yeah. and have a tendency to blame ourselves in our shame. Right. Guilt is more, there are two parts to guilt. You're either guilty or you're not, <laughs> is uh -huh. one part to guilt. Yeah. So guilt is, uh, there can be a valid emotion with regard to guilt in that we did do something wrong and we feel bad about it. Uh, is that what you mean? No, we are guilty. Yes. And the, we, the, it, the true terminology of guilt yep. or guilty is you did it. Yep. Did you do it or not? Yes, I did. You're guilty. Yeah, <laughs> I see. <laughs> There's no emotional connotation to it. No. Right? It's a factual thing. It's just a factual thing. Yep. It's like when the judge pronounces judgment, he says, you're guilty. Yes, you did that. That's all he's really saying. He's not judging the fact how you did, that you did it that and how you bad are you bad. are and yeah. you are bad and all those other things, even yeah. though most people take it that way. Yeah. The reality is he's just saying you did that and you're guilty. Yeah. Right? So when I talk about guilt, I'm talking about it in the pure sense of the word. Guilt is you did something wrong. Uh -huh. No arguments, no buts, no reasons why. You just did something wrong. Yeah. Right? That feeling of knowing that you did something wrong, you often feel ashamed about see. So within this process of repentance, you're saying that you feel guilt and shame and guilt in that sense is the acknowledgement that yes, I did do something wrong. Yes. And shame is the feeling bad about the fact that you did do that thing wrong. Correct. Within that process. Correct. Okay, got you. And if we choose to feel the effect of our guilt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the shame, yep. then we'll release the shame and we'll be motivated to find out why we did that thing wrong. Mm -hmm. And what was the underlying causal emotions that motivated us to do that thing wrong? Yeah. So, so that kind of shame is still in effect, mm -hmm. but, but it's a helper. Yes. To help us to acknowledge guilt, mm -hmm. true guilt, from God's perspective. Yeah. We actually, yes or no, did we do something wrong or not? Now, here I'm not talking about when you're a child and you, start, you come home and you said to mummy, oh, I told the next door neighbour that, you know, you, you, you know, Slept with the guy down the road, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know something innocent that a child might do, and mummy goes berserk, yeah, and set, and and basically treats the child as if they did something wrong, yeah. when the child did nothing wrong, yeah. from God's perspective. So, so this is a problem with many of our emotions: is that we were told they, that things were wrong mm -hmm. when they were not, yeah. and what we've got to do is see all of these things from God's perspective. A person who tells the truth hasn't done anything wrong. And this is where you talking about the second instance where the shame that we can then live in, this feeling I am bad all of the time, is actually an effect and almost an avoidance of the pain of, hey, I didn't do the wrong thing but I was blamed and made to feel like I'm bad because I did the right thing. 
Well, uh, it's not only oh, avoidance the of the sin. pain, yep. it's an avoidance of the truth. Yeah. See, see, from God's perspective, we are not intrinsically bad, mm -hmm. for number one. So that's one truth that we're totally ignoring. Also, we're ignoring the truth of how we got to feel this way, which is somebody, and it had to be of somebody in our childhood environment, mm -hmm. treated us as if we had something to be ashamed about. Yeah. That's how we got to feel this way. Yeah. And we need to come to the truth of that, acknowledge that. The majority of people don't. Mm -hmm. right? They'd rather not do that. And so what they do is they just feel shame for the rest of their life. They feel like there's something wrong with them yeah. the rest of their life so that they can maintain a relationship with their parents. Yeah. Because the reality is the majority of us, if we felt what our parents actually did, would find a struggle to actually maintain a relationship with our parents unless our parents were repentant for what they did. That's reality. Yeah. But the majority of us ignore all of that so that we can play happy families. Yeah. And that causes us then to take all the burden of the treatment mm -hmm. and blame ourselves, mm -hmm. which is obviously going to be quite harmful to ourselves continuously. And so then we end up with huge groups of people just living with an inherent sense that they are bad all of the time. Yes, and then acting as if they're bad. So they're yeah. taking drugs or taking drinking alcohol or because they've Overeating. taken all yep. the blame yep. for what their parents actually did. Yep. Yep. And and parents with children who have abuse issues, alcohol abuse, I mean substance abuse issues, need to have a good strong look at themselves because there's a high likelihood that they are, have contributed immensely to the fact that that child is now taking drugs or alcohol as through, through their emotional, shame. as yeah. a result of shame, as a result of their emotional feelings toward, perpetrated toward the ch children when the ch children were young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying in that second instance where we're in shame that this becomes... Second instance, no, let's be more specific. Okay. <laughs> where we haven't done anything wrong, mm -hmm. but we've been made to feel that we have. Have, yeah, from our environment. Yeah, yep. from our environment as a child. Yes. That that can become a globalised feeling that I am bad all of the time. Mm -hmm. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of our parents probably treated us like we were bad all of the time. Yes. You or, know, that like, you know, it's quite remarkable in fact how many parents do believe their child is intrinsically bad. Mm -hmm. I've had many, many discussions with parents who have told me that their child was bad from the moment they were born. Yeah. And this is not true obviously but it's what they believe. Yeah. So you know they've treated their child like they're bad from the moment they were born. Yeah. So that child's going to have a lot of shame and, if, and, and the child needs to then feel what's underneath the effect Mm -hmm. which the, sh if the effect is shame of that treatment is, is shame and the cause is the treatment. Yeah, the and pain, the of, pain the, of the treatment. It's the, the avoidance of the pain of the treatment that maintains, that maintains the, the shame. of shame. Yes, because once you realise that you've been treated badly, you no longer feel ashamed of yourself. You might feel quite angry with the person who treated you badly, yeah. but you will no longer feel ashamed of yourself. Yeah. So you'll have made progress in terms of how you see yourself. Mm. Mm. I think it's in Brene Brown's literature, she talks about shame being the feeling that you are bad all of the time and guilt being the feeling that you've done something wrong in a certain instance. Can I, can Whereas, I point out though that even that has a flawed, is a flawed definition because if you're feeling bad all the time, mm -hmm. then I suggest you're not feeling bad all the time. You're not feeling bad yep. all the time. Yep. You think you are bad, so you're living in the state of being bad. You're not feeling it. Yes. Like when, when you feel emotions, they generally pass through you, yeah. right? So, so like... And, and to be fair to Brene, yeah. I may have paraphrased her wrong, because yeah. this says that it's a belief that we are flawed. It's the painful experience of it, a feeling. That is definitely true. Yes. It is the belief that we are flawed. Yeah. Now, that belief is the effect. So it's not a causal emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's pointless as feeling it all the time. Yes. We need to feel the causal emotion that created it. The causal emotion that created it was how we've been treated. And usually a person who feels shame all the time does not want to feel how that shame came about. Yeah. They don't want to feel the causal emotion. Yeah. 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 So that's what that, I see the main problem being. Yeah. So 
I just wanted to contrast that with the first instance we talked about, which was about shame occurring through the process of repentance yep. or drawing us towards repentance. That feeling as we are moving through repentance of shame that you describe, is that... And by the way, it's not repentance for things that from God's perspective we don't need to repent for. No, it's where we actually <laughs> from God's perspective have taken an action out of, out harmony, of, with out of harmony with love, Correct. With our own free will. Because there's many parents that. who want to tell us that it's their rules that we need to repent about and that's, and that's not true. That's either. where I see that shame limits so many people. It limits people in, in sexual expression, in self-expression, in in pursuing their desires that are in harmony with love. It does. A lot of people are limited by shame to do these things that can be quite pure and in harmony with love. And that's all about the parents' definitions yes. of what the rules should be. Yes. But in this in this other instance where we actually have taken a free will choice, it's out of harmony with love from God's perspective, and mm. we realise that and mm. we are feeling shame, mm-hmm. is that feeling a feeling... I am all bad, or is it a feeling that is I was bad in relation to that event? Well, the problem with this feeling of shame yeah. that is created through our own choices yeah. is that we can then start to think that we're all bad, mm-hmm. even though we've only taken one thing. But we have to have had a predisposition to that kind of viewpoint. Uh-huh. So in other words, there has to be something that's come from our childhood that tells us that whenever we've done something bad, it means we're all bad, all rather time. than yeah. just did one thing bad. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. From God's perspective, you just did one thing bad. Yeah. Out of harmony with love. Yeah. And yes, you should feel about that, but you'd be far better off feeling the reason why you did it. Mm -hmm. If you stay in the shame of having done it, you will not feel the cause. And that's the problem. Yeah. Unless you feel the cause, you can do it again. Right? Mm -hmm. And You'll be driv- unless you feel the cause, you'll be driven by the fear of the shame that's now within you that you don't want to feel. So, you know, now you're opening yourself to further actions out of harmony with love that are now driven by the suppression of shame. Yeah. And that's not a very good choice to make. Yeah. You'd be far better off saying, okay, I do feel ashamed. I feel ashamed about what I did. I need to find the reason why I did it. There's some underlying reason why I did it. That, that, that then has resulted in me taking the actions I took. Mm-hmm. That then makes me feel bad about myself. Mm. So these are all effects of the underlying causal emotion. Yeah. So, so pretty much all shame is the effect of underlying causal emotion. But some shame is, you could say, motivated by the, the guilt. True guilt. In, true yeah. guilt in, yeah. the, in the meaning that I have said it before, and that is you did, did you do something wrong? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. You're guilty. <laughs> That's true guilt. And usually if we feel about that, we'll feel some shame. And what we need to do is go through feeling the shame of that mm-hmm. and, and come out of the other end to the point where we're willing to look at the underlying reason why we chose to take that action that was unloving. Yep. So the shame can help us get there yep. or it can hinder us depending on whether we suppress it or feel it. Yes. If we feel it, we'll probably it'll help us get there because yep. we'll go... I don't want to feel this bad ever again, so I want to find the reason why I did it. Yeah. But if we don't feel it, then we won't find the reason why we did it. And we're now consigning ourselves to, to the fact that we're going to do it again. Yeah. Or we're going to live in fear of our shame, Yeah. one of the two. Yeah. And so we'll do other things that will be out of harmony with love because anything driven by fear is going to be out of harmony with love. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but sounds like the most destructive way that the majority of people live in shame is that they're living in shame, not feeling it, and they're feeling that they're wrong and bad in ways that are not really wrong and bad from God's perspective. Correct. And in that case, you're saying living in that state is actually the avoidance of the deeper pain Correct. that will liberate the person in many ways, including right. from the feeling of shame yes. once they connect to it. Yes. Yeah. Now, okay. I've, I've been asked for the definition of shame in this question. Yeah. <laughs> I would define shame as an effect emotion, not a causal emotion, relating to either one of the two following things. One, the treat bad or poor treatment from our, in our environment of ourselves, where we then come to accept the poor treatment as ourselves being the cause, and that is not true. Mm-hmm. Or two, 
the fact that we have chosen through our free will to take actions that are out of harmony with love and refuse to, to feel about the reasons why we did such a thing. Beautiful. And that's what shame is. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you. If we can add to that, what would you say is God's view of shame? That's the second part of our question. Well, it depends on what type of shame we're talking about. Yeah. So if we're talking about the first kind of shame, which was triggered by uh, bad treatment during our childhood, then God's view of that shame is that we don't need to feel it at all. Mm -hmm. And so, and God, in fact, doesn't feel that we need to be ashamed of ourselves under those circumstances. No, but no matter how bad we were treated, badly we were treated during our childhood, God doesn't feel we have anything to be ashamed of for, for that treatment. Yep. So that's first. The second type of shame, which is the one driven by the fact that we're guilty of, a, of some kind of wrongdoing with regard to definition of God, wrongdoing is anything that we did out of harmony with love from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, God doesn't feel we need to feel specifically shame about that, but God knows that shame will be the result of us taking those particular actions. Mm -hmm. and, but God knows that shame is not a motivating um, solution to the problem. In other words, a person who lives in shame generally becomes quite selfish, quite fearful, and quite uh, out of harmony with love with the rest of their actions. Yeah. God knows that the best way, and God has designed his universe this way, that the best way to deal with any emotion is to find the underlying reason why you chose to do such a thing. So the best way to deal with any unloving action or unloving word or unloving thought is to find the underlying reason why such an unloving action, thought or word appeared. Yeah. And shame is not going to help you do that. No. It's not going to help you do that. It may provide some motivation to do it perhaps, yeah. but it won't help you do it. To, to really find underlying causal emotions relating to why you chose to take actions out of harmony with love takes a lot more courage mm -hmm. than just feeling shame. Yeah. Right? And this is where I feel a lot of people in, who are constantly carrying shame with them are using shame as an avoidance technique mm -hmm. rather than actually a desire, uh, using it as a motivation to get to a deeper emotion. And, and if we're using shame as an avoidance technique, we are way out of harmony with God's view of shame. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And we need to understand that. Mm. So, so God's view of shame basically is that if it's related to our childhood, it's something we don't even need to feel. Yeah. Right? And if it's related to our own free will choices that are out of harmony with love, then certainly we're going to feel it because it's an automatic compensatory effect on our soul that's occurred. However, if you feel it, you will want to find the actual cause of why you did that. Yeah. If you choose to deny your shame or to live in it, you know, soak in it like a, like a bath, <laughs> then is... you will never take courageous actions to find the reason why you chose to do or take those actions that were unloving. Yeah. Yep. So shame can become a very narcissistic emotion if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many people do live in their shame and live very narcissistic lives as a result. Mm. Yep. It's very helpful. Mm. Thank you. Our next question comes to us from Susan. Yep. She says, some people are naturally not that emotional. <laughs> So what exactly does it mean to work through your emotional injuries, feel the full extent of emotions and release them? Mm -hmm. AJ talks about crying a lot or beating the hell out of a beanbag if the injury is anger or rage. But what if some people just aren't emotional like that? How do you release when you're not that emotional? <laughs> Honestly, Susan, you don't understand the soul yet. <laughs> right? The reality is, is God designed the soul to be emotional. Yeah. So everyone is emotional. Yeah. If you are shut down to the extent that Susan is, yeah. then you will feel like you're not as emotional as other people. Mm -hmm. Like I can remember during my life that once I hit, I think it was like 10 or 12, I never cried from then until when I started first processing emotions when I was 33. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, you can shut down your emotions in complete denial if you want to. Mm -hmm. But, but don't claim that it's just because you're not emotional. Yeah. 
because you are. God designed you to be emotional. There's no, this belief that some people are more emotional than others is not true. Mm. It's not true. God designed your soul to, be, to have emotions flowing through it 100% of the time, all the time. That's how God designed your soul. All of us have various ways which that expresses itself in the sense that some of us have been shut down quite intensely as children and so therefore we don't have any emotion flowing through our soul like that. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we do have to somehow open up to them again. Yeah. Other people are histrionic. Yeah. They are drama queens. They use emotion as a manipulative technique to engage their addictions. And we know many people like that. Definitely. That's not the kind of emotion I'm talking about either. Because that's not really true emotion no, either, is it? not at all. It's an expression of rage or passive aggression or manipulation. Manipulation or... and addiction, really. Yep. It's just an addiction. Addiction. It's an addiction yep. to avoid underlying fears and underlying real emotion. Mm -hmm. but, but there are lots of people who do that. In fact, the majority of my life, whenever I've seen a person emotional, generally... They are like that. Yeah. And the average person in our seminars that flies off the handle all of a sudden and screams and yells and carries on in the middle of a seminar is like that. Yeah. They have emotions going on which are all about addictions and avoidance of their real feelings. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not talking about those emotions. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, though, is that God designed your soul to have a 100% flow of all of your emotions. If you're saying to me that some people are not emotional as other people, that is completely incorrect mm -hmm. and, and completely untrue and only the result of injuries. Yeah. So, Susan, I'm sorry, but dear, but you are in denial of your emotion. That's mm -hmm. why your emotion is shut down. And any person who says, who makes these comments, who asks these kind of questions, and we have many hundreds of questions mm -hmm. <laughs> from people saying, I'm not as emotional as other people, yeah. you know, all of you are wrong. You are as emotional as other people. It's just that you've had more things happen to you that caused you to shut down your emotions. Yeah. And you need to come to terms with the fact that you, you must be pretty shut down if God designed you to be emotional. Mm. So my suggestion is, instead of telling yourself that you're not as emotional as other people, mm -hmm. you need to see that not being as emotional as other people, if, it's, if you're comparing yourself with people who are drama queens and, and, and you know, just, uh, what was the other word histrionic. I used? Histrionic. Then don't, because they are not feeling their emotions either. They're just using an emotional technique of manipulation to avoid their real emotions. So don't compare yourself to those people. But if you're comparing yourself to me, as this lady is doing, mm -hmm. right, she's saying that I have, you know, cried and bashed things and whatever else to yeah. get to my emotions, and I'm not a histrionic person. No. <laughs> and for a large portion of my life, I was completely shut down to my emotions from, like I said, from the time I was 12 to the time I was 33, 20, 21 years, mm -hmm. I was completely shut down to my emotion, completely shut down. So if I can get from being completely sh shut down to my emotions to being open to my emotions and everyone else's emotions, and I'm telling you that the reason why I did that was because I became open emotionally from a state of denial, mm -hmm. then I suggest to you, Susan, that you can do the same. Yeah. Yep. And Susan's question, her final question was, how do you release when you're not that emotional? And the, the answer is really about well, working. Well, really what she's saying is how do, how do you release when you're in denial? That's the real question. Yeah. And the answer is you can't. No. You cannot release causal emotion while you're in denial that even those emotions exist. Mm -hmm. And Susan is in denial that these emotions exist. Yeah. So, so while she's in denial that these emotions exist, she will not be able to connect to them, nor will she be able to release them. And in fact, maintaining denial that these emotions exist are, is just one method she is using in order to stay away from the painful emotions. So she's using it as a method to stay away from her personal pain, yeah. telling herself that she is not like the average person and therefore not generally emotional, mm -hmm. is, a, is a method that she's been taught to, to, to demonstrate or that she's learned herself mm -hmm. to avoid the experience of her emotions. Yeah. And she's going to need to undo that if she's ever going to get to become at one with God. Yeah. Mm. I feel a lot of compassion for people who... who probably because I've been one of them, who we reach adulthood and um, feel totally disconnected from our emotional mm, selves. Yeah, and, so. and 
what I feel from Susan's question is there's a lot of judgment within her from her experience of emotion. Definitely. She feels like she doesn't, not only is she not that emotional, she doesn't want to be. No. And. But, but see, we've got to be honest here. Yeah. There's, there's two things here, isn't there? There's do I desire to actually feel my emotions? Mm -hmm. And Susan doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right? And then the second question is, Am I using a technique to avoid emotions unwittingly? Yep. All right? And that's very different. That's, that's, like, that's what I would classify as ignorance of how important emotions are. Mm -hmm. Now, Susan's not ignorant of how important they are because she's probably listened to me for a while <laughs> and therefore knows that I've stated it over and over again. So she is actively mm -hmm. attempting to deny her emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, I have less compassion for such a person. I see. Yeah. <laughs> than a person who unwittingly or, uh, or ignorantly does not know mm -hmm. that releasing their emotions will help them. Mm -hmm. A person who's choosing to avoid their emotions, choosing to remain in denial, and choosing purposefully to tell them, and even tells themselves that they're just not as emotional as other people, yep. that's a purposeful choice to tell yourself a message that is not true. Mm. And that is a technique you're using to avoid your emotions, sure. Mm -hmm. but, but you've got to be honest about that technique. You are not going to progress towards God while you have that technique in play. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the reason why you chose to tell yourself these messages. And yes, a lot of that is related to childhood emotion. And that's yeah. where I do have compassion. Yeah. Childhood emotion, and particularly the suppression of childhood emotion by parents, and the suggestions and violence that often comes from parents to suppress childhood emotion mm -hmm. causes us to grow up and become a person who has little experience of emotion. Yeah. That's what it and, does. And judgment of emotion. And to have judgment of emotion. So we need to be careful here. Is it judgment of emotion that's Susan's problem? Mm -hmm. Or is it denial of a truth that's Susan's problem? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I suggest to, that, that, yes, the denial of the truth is motivated partially by judgment, yeah. but mostly by her own avoidance of pain, uh -huh. mostly by her desire to deny the experience of pain, which, which everyone has emotionally in them. Yeah. Do, do you see? Yeah. So we've I got think. to be careful that we, we, that we say, you know, what is really going on for, for individuals. Mm. Now... Judgment certainly is a problem of emotion and some people will have to go through feelings relating to how much their own emotion as a child was judged. Yeah. And certainly a person doesn't arrive in a state of denial without there being some judgment of emotion occurring in their childhood. Yeah. But the real question becomes, is that judgment unwitting or, or ignor ignorance of the truth mm -hmm. or is it a purposeful desire to avoid the truth? Now, in Susan's case, it is a purposeful desire to avoid the truth. Yeah. She's been told the truth that emotions are, God created them. God created you to be an emotional being. Your soul is emotional. She's been told these truths, but she doesn't want to accept them. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a purposeful choice, mm -hmm. to not accept the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, if you purposefully choose to not accept this truth, as many do, you will never become at one with God, yeah. ever. You are consigning yourself to progress in love, but only in natural love. You will never be able to receive God's love to the point of at one moment while you tell yourselves these untruths. Mm -hmm. So I feel that every person who tells themselves this kind of message is telling themselves an untruth. And while you tell yourself such an untruth, you will never become at one with God. So while you may progress a bit because you'll have to use anything other than emotional techniques to progress, you will not love, you will not come to know it, and you'll certainly not come to experience God's love because God's love is a very overpowering emotion mm. which will overpower you every time you experience it. And so if you're not, it, you will definitely be emotional while you feel that. And if you're not, it means you're not feeling it. It means that you're in denial, you're shut down to your own emotions. So stop telling yourself messages that are not true. Mm. Stop making the choice to tell yourself. And the choice to tell yourself something after you've heard the truth, the choice to tell yourself the opposite, the lie, is a choice. Mm. And that's totally different mm -hmm. than you not doing it because of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And this is what people need to realise. Once you've heard the truth 
about God and the way God op- created the soul and the human soul itself, the, the, the decision you're going to have to make is do you have enough trust in that to believe it and take actions about it or not? Mm-hmm. Sue doesn't. Mm-hmm. Susan doesn't. Mm-hmm. Susan wants to not believe it. Mm. She wants to deny that it's a problem. She wants to deny that emotions are going to, you know, she even wants to deny that she's an emotional being. Mm-hmm. And so that is an active choice taken to completely distance herself from God's truth on the matter. And that is not taken out of judgment, no. although judgment may be involved. That's an expression of her will mm-hmm. to not feel painful emotions. Yeah, that's an important distinction you're making there. Yes. Mm. And I, I feel that uh, a lot of people, as you know, have left the path of divine truth yep. mostly because they don't want to feel emotion. They, well, to be more frank, mostly because they don't want to feel pain. Right? And we tell them, oftentimes they come to us and ask us about where they are at emotionally. We tell them they feel pained by our response and from then on they don't want to hear the truth. That is an active choice that they've made to deny their own emotional experience and to deny the truth about how God has created their soul. While you do that, you are not going to progress towards God. Mm. You are just never going to progress. You can tell yourself that to you blue in the face. You will not progress towards God. You can, you can may, blame me for suggesting that emotion is the way towards God, but it's not my fault that emotion is <laughs> the way towards God. Right? God designed it that way. <laughs> God designed, God, God knows, and God designed it, our soul in such a way that progression towards God in love is not possible without us being emotional beings. That's, much as that's we, reality. Yeah. As much as people on earth want to tell you differently, that is the reality of God's truth. Now, if Susan had said, I don't believe you, that would have been more honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel, Susan, what you need to have asked me said is just, AJ, I don't believe that emotions are the way to God. And I'll go, Susan, you're allowed to believe whatever you like. <laughs> However, the reality is emotions are the way to God. And you will find sometime in your future that unless you start engaging your emotions, you will never become at one with God. Mm. So I'm okay with you believing it, but as long as you believe that emotions are not the way to God and that you are somehow, you know, different to other people and, and unique and you don't have emotions, as long as you believe these particular things, you will never become at one with God. So, so try it out for a while. Try it out for the next 20 years and see how you go. See whether you become at one with God in the next 20 years using your method. <laughs> and, uh, and I suggest to you, you will not. Thanks. No worries. <laughs> okay. This question relates to emotions of self-deception. Yep. And you and I gave a seminar on that topic four or five years ago. Yeah, I think it was 2010 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So this person says, thank you so much for speaking about the emotions of self-deception. Mm-hmm. I'm totally stuck with processing and these, and these kinds of emotions. Mm. I've been really losing faith that I can do this. I feel like I'm just going around in circles with shame and anger and getting nowhere. And to be honest, I really just want to give up. Mm. Can you talk a bit about what signs there may be that we're actually getting somewhere instead of going around in circles? Well, I think she's identified the signs. (laughs) (laughs) When you go around in circles, you feel like you want to give up. Uh, When you go around in circles, you... You feel like you're processing emotions, but you know nothing's really changing. Mm -hmm. So these are all signs that you're just going around in circles and nothing's really changing. Now, and signs that you are completely in self-deception. In other words, you are processing through emotions of Mm self-deception. So it's pointless doing that. Now, the the real thing we need to look at, though, is why are we doing it? Mm. So why do, in this case, the lady saying she's fluctuating between emotions of shame, yep. which is an effect emotion, yep. and anger, which is also an effect emotion mm-hmm. most of the time. So she's fluctuating between two effect emotions. Of course, if you fluctuate between two effect emotions, you will never address causal emotion. Mm-hmm. So of course, you're never going to progress. You're never going to become at one with God doing that. So you can f- do this for the rest of your life and nothing will change. And of course, after a while, you'll get tired of that. And then you'll say, 
oh, it's all because of AJ's teachings about emotions. <laughs> right? And obviously it's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. When we are in motions of self-deception, such as shame and anger and so forth, we are doing it to avoid other things. And we need to have a good solid look at our will, how we're using our will. We're using our will to stay in emotions that are preferable, self-deception emotions are preferable, mm -hmm. rather than feeling the emotions that are not preferred, the more painful emotions that we don't wish to experience. That's why we choose to be self-deceived. Mm. So when you're fluctuating between shame, anger, shame, anger, shame, anger, feeling different emotions that are around in this cycle, what you're doing is you're fluctuating between two self-deceptive emotions. They're not the causal emotions. Mm. So you're fluctuating between two self-deception emotions. One is you wanting to blame other people and the other one is you want to blame yourself. Yeah. And both of those things are not true. Yeah. You can't blame other people and you can't blame <laughs> yourself. You need to get deeper into the actual causal pain. Most people who fluctuate in, in self-deception emotions are not willing to go to their real pain. That's the problem. They don't trust God. They have no faith that God will help them through the process. They don't trust that this is the actual process. And they justify to themselves that there's no reason to do it. And they'd prefer to feel like they're doing something. And so what they do is they create effect-based emotions, mm -hmm. such as shame and anger and so forth. And then they choose to feel all of that. Now, you do all of that because you're avoiding your addictions. You don't want to feel your addictions. Mm -hmm. And every time you, you get your addictions met, you're happy. Mm -hmm. And every time your addictions are not met, you either go into self, you know, shame. Punishment. In other words, self-punishment. Yeah. Or you go into anger, mm -hmm. where you want to punish someone else. Mm -hmm. Both things are really anger. Mm -hmm. One's anger with yourself and the other one is anger with someone else. And both of them are in avoidance of the addiction that you're actually in. So what you need to do to get out of this cycle is to be really honest about your addictions. What I observe is the majority of people who don't want to have, be honest about their addictions at all. Mm. In, a pre, in, a, in a recent um, seminar at Kyabra, it was called Understanding Your Emotional Self. I talked to a group of people who were involved in an interaction relating to different emotions they were experiencing. Yeah. Very few of them wanted to see what was really going on. Yeah. One of them reverted to feeling like she was to blame when mm. she wasn't. Mm -hmm. The other one reverted to feeling like someone else to blame when they weren't. Yeah. And she was actually to blame for her unloving behaviour. Yeah. And, and many of them had no desire to work through why they didn't, you know, have direct honest communication yeah. with the real problem. Yeah. And, and so we find this happening all the time. Yeah. All of it's driven by emotions of self-deception. Mm -hmm. They want to believe that it's this problem or that problem when it's not. Mm. Many people who are abusive towards other people want to believe that the other people have been abusive to them. Yeah. <laughs> that's the reality. That's what justifies, that's how they justify their abusive behaviour. Mm. Like we have many people interact with us who who get angry with us or attempt to abuse us. And then when we draw the line in the sand, they tell us that we're the ones being unloving. <laughs> how is that? <laughs> like, how do they even come to that conclusion? By deceiving themselves. That's how they'd come to that conclusion. Yeah. So many people desire self-deception and we've got to examine the reason why. And the main reason why is we don't want to let go of our addictions. Mm. We would prefer to have our addictions met. And when they don't get met, we either punish ourselves or punish someone else, but our addictions are still there yep. and we're still not acknowledging them. And often we, we cry, we're crying, not recognising that we're just crying because we're angry or we're not getting it. And that's something we talked about in that talk yes. of emotions of self-deception. Correct. But basically you're saying all of this emotional stuff that's going on in this state is occurring because we want to avoid the truth of our addictions. Yes, and we want to avoid the truth of our fears and we want to avoid the feeling and experiencing the real pain. Mm -hmm. So we, we are very uh, clever at substituting pain. Mm -hmm. In other words, we decide that that pain over there is too hard for me to experience 
But this pain is okay, I can handle that pain. Now, if you get into that state where you start substituting pain, which is a self-deceptive state, you will find eventually even that pain becomes frustrating. Yes. And too painful to experience. Yeah. So even the self-deception pain yeah. will eventually become frustrating to experience. Well, even more frustrating, really, won't it? Because you, there's no relief. There's no relief from it, yeah. ever, yeah. ever, because it's just a self-deception. It's just an emotion we're creating to avoid another emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's self-deception. And while we feel those emotions, nothing will change. Not a single thing will change. We cannot become one with God while we're doing this. Mm -hmm. You see, we've got to be a lot more truthful with ourselves. And the majority of people aren't very truthful with themselves when they begin this process. And they've got to go through the process of going, wow, I just did all that to avoid a whole heap of things. Yeah. And I might as well stop doing it. I may as well instead look at what I'm avoiding by doing it. That's what I need to do, become really honest about what's really going on inside of myself. And you, you can get help to do that. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can go to a psychologist to get some help to do that. There are some good people, psychologists, who might be able to help you say, well, there you go again. You're off feeling something that, you know, it's not even true. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, yep. There you go again. There you go again. Now you're drama queening again. You know, like, <laughs> now you're creating this emotion of self-deception again. And eventually we might realise every time we do it, and then realise what the motivation is. Yeah. And that that's the key thing. Yeah. We need to find the motivation for our self-deception. Mm -hmm. And there's always a motivation. And this is where you said earlier that it's an issue of will. Yes. So basically we need to find where our will is actually directed away from causal emotion and why what's motivating that will well, why? what do i really want to do here what yeah. am i trying to achieve here yeah. what i'm trying to achieve is avoidance of my addictions yeah. i'm trying to not be be clueless about my addictions that's mm -hmm. what i'm trying to do mm -hmm. i've got to be honest about that if i'm ever going to get beyond my addictions mm -hmm. i've got to be honest about my addictions to get beyond them i've got to be honest about my fear in order to feel it i've got to be honest about the pain that's in me before i'll feel the pain that's in me most people are not, no. right? So, so what we do instead is we create a whole group of other emotions which are all self-created often or learned techniques that we learn, you know, usually during our later childhood years of how to avoid the emotion. Mm -hmm. And then we engage those particular techniques and we think we're emotional processing. No, you're not. You're not processing through emotion. You're not actually working through it. You're not actually experiencing causal emotion. You're just creating new emotions to you, for your feel so that you can avoid doing that and, and avoid telling yourself the truth that you're really scared yeah. of getting to what is the real problem. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. And this is the problem with not acknowledging fear yeah. is that we eventually we eventually create motions of self-deception in order to not acknowledge what is really the problem because we're too afraid to acknowledge what is really the problem. So then if we go back to the second part of this question, mm -hmm. which was could you talk a bit about what signs there may be when we're actually getting somewhere, so when we're actually starting to move through causal okay, emotions so let's or talk even about, addictions? Let's talk about, you know, because there's well, a let's process, talk about, isn't there? We've talked about the signs of what happens when you're not. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about some of the signs of what happens when you are. When you are actually processing through causal emotion, every time you process an emotion, you feel relief. Mm -hmm. your, your body will physically change. You will notice less lines on your face. You'll notice like any weight that you've put on temporarily comes off again. Yeah. You'll notice that you feel more joy. You feel uh, more alive and more engaged. You also feel more sensitive to truth mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. So you notice things more than you did before. Mm -hmm. and, and also your behaviour is more loving automatically. So you're not trying. You're not trying to be yeah. loving you just automatically feel like you want to be loving yeah. and you automatically are as a result. These are all signs that you actually are processing through causal emotion. Mm -hmm. If none of those things are actually occurring, then you're not processing through causal emotion, no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you feel fear, no matter how much you're feeling shame, you're not processing through causal emotion. You're in the addiction. Yeah. 
and you need to be honest with yourself. If, so what basically we can say is if there is no positive change towards love that's automatic, then you are not processing causal motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's only two reasons why that could be occurring. One is that you're processing through the layers of addiction and, and it's only when you get to the causal motion that eventually there'll be some release. And we do need to process through the layers of addiction. We do need to come to see our addictions. That is certainly true. But while we're doing that, we probably will find that we're not, you know, outwardly much different than what we were before because it's our causal emotion that needs to change, everything. that changes everything. So we might be doing that or more often than not, we are in emotions of self-deception mm. if we're feeling emotion, where we're, where we're going through all these different emotional experiences and none of them are real. Yep. And none of them are real because we don't want any of them to be real. <laughs> we need to understand it's the use of our will. Yeah. Do you think there's signs that we have, a, even before we get to releasing causal emotion, if we are in the process of working through addiction mm -hmm. and getting more in contact with fear, do you think that there's signs that we have of course, there's signs, but they're, easy, they're much they're less, more difficult to read yeah. from an external perspective. And this is where we have to be really honest with ourselves, yeah. isn't it? Like, yeah. if we're really honest and we hear all this theory, we can start to identify, am I in self-deception? Am I working through addiction? Is yeah. this causal emotion? Yeah. yeah. Causal emotion is beautiful to feel. You, yeah. You'll enjoy feeling it, yeah. probably. Yeah. It causes you to feel connected to your soul. Even, though, even if it's grief, even if it's terrible grief or fear, it feels you, you're connected with your soul. You, there's always a relief in your body afterwards. Mm -hmm. There's always a relief in your emotional state afterwards. Things around you, your law of attraction changes instantly as soon as you've actually made a, a release mm -hmm. of a causal emotion. Your, your attractions will change instantly. Um, you'll be less influenced by spirits. You'll be more positive, uh, less negative. Um, so, you know, <laughs> these are the changes that automatically occur. And... And if they are not occurring, you, you would need to examine, yeah, there's a high likelihood I'm in self-deception or I'm processing through my addictions, one of the two. Mm -hmm. Now, there are signs you're processing through your addictions, mm -hmm. and it's quite simple. Your addictions reduce <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you process through your addictions and you become more afraid. Yeah. In other words, if you're truly processing through your addictions, you don't revert to anger, right? Mm -hmm. The anger is a sign that you're not processing through your addictions. Yep. If you're pr truly processing through your addictions, what happens is you become more afraid because remember, every addiction was created in order to cover over your fear. Yep. So as you expose every addiction, you feel more fear as a result. So mm -hmm. if you're becoming more afraid, mm -hmm. right, and you notice in your life there's less physical and emotional addictions, yep. then that means you're processing through your addictions. Yep. But if you're not becoming more afraid, right, then you're not processing through your addictions mm -hmm. because your addictions are the layer upon your fear. So becoming more afraid is actually a good sign if you're processing through your addictions. You're not yet at your causal emotion, perhaps, but there is, there's the sign that there's something happening that's causing you to shift from being in denial mm -hmm. into being aware of the the underlying fear that drives most of your addictive behaviour. So that's how you know you're, you're working through addiction. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So, so it may take quite a few years for the average person on the planet to work through addiction. Mm -hmm. We have uh, usually established addictions at a very, very young age and, uh, and usually most of them being taught to us. And so it does take time to work our way through those addictions and feel and allow ourselves to feel the fear that's underneath that drives those addictions, the fear of grief or the fear of other childhood emotions. Even the fear of just being a child yeah. causes you to do all sorts of things in addiction. What about this situation that I see occurring where people hear about divine truth, um, they hear about addictions, and a lot of people have been totally clueless that they've lived their entire life in addiction. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. thought that it's normal and that it's love when your addictions get met and mm -hmm. it's all very... And then they sort of go, oh, wow. They start to acknowledge. They start to acknowledge intellectually that mm -hmm. there's issues. Yeah. And they restrict their lifestyle and their habits in mm -hmm. certain ways in an effort to try to not be in so much addiction or challenge their addiction. Yeah. 
And then so they, they feel get... some guilt about their addiction. Yes. <laughs> you could say, yeah. In other words, yes, I'm guilty. I did do that. <laughs> yeah. so and that feel... is not loving. <clears throat> and that's not loving that. and yeah. I can see that. So yeah. they then feel motivated to try to address some of these addictions. Yeah. <laughs> and then I notice people get to this point where they just feel terrible. They feel like there's no point, it's all painful, it's all yucky, it's all... Yeah, still all self-deception because this is avoidance of their fear. Yeah. Like, so they're coming up to the fear wall. You can mm -hmm. say the wall of fear is there, like so. Mm -hmm. And they're coming up to the fear wall as they deal with each addiction and as they notice each addiction, they're coming closer and closer to their wall of fear. Yeah. What I notice is most people become, even just start to see their wall of fear and then they run away. And most people run away from divine truth at that point, yeah. actually. That's the point where almost everybody who's ever left divine truth, mm -hmm. ever left the way, has left because they've come face to face with their fear and yeah. they don't want to face their fear, so they go. Yeah. They just run away. And many of them run away for years and some centuries and some thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some have run away for a long time mm -hmm. because they don't want to actually confront and work their way through their fears. Yeah. Right. So we need to be honest with ourselves even there. If we feel like we're getting to a place where we're just feeling like sad all the time, not apathetic. motivated, apathetic, don't want to go forward, don't want to go back, yeah. it's because we're terrified. Yeah. And we need to start letting ourselves feel our terror, feel our fear about what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what I find is the mo most, most people, particularly women, but most people are very intolerant of the emotions of fear. Mm -hmm. So, and they'll do almost anything to avoid them. And, and they'll blame anybody in order to avoid them. And they'll get angry with anybody in order to avoid them. And they'll say all sorts of lies and all sorts of things to avoid them. And they'll say and engage in all sorts of self-deception in order to avoid them. Yep. And we've got to be honest with ourselves in that place. And we've got to say, actually, you know what? I'm really just terrified. <laughs> and, and, and once we even acknowledge that, we have a, a stronger ability to develop the desire to feel it. Because in the end, it's only the desire to feel it that will, mo will motivate us to get through that. Yeah. And for me, it's my desire for my relationship with God and my relationship with you that motivates me through th those fears. Yeah. Motivates me to just sit in the fear and feel it rather than acting upon it. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've found is there's got to be something that's more important to you than the fear itself mm -hmm. in order for you to go through fear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I feel most people don't go through their fear because there's nothing more important to them than their fear. Mm -hmm. They, they honour their fear, they treat it like a god, and as a result they don't have much of a desire to work through it. Mm -hmm. you, to, have a, to develop a desire to work through your fear is a very key part of this path. Yeah. The way to God, on the way to God, by the time you're at one with God, fear is non-existent in your life. That means you live everything like day in harmony with truth. That in this world that we live in now, that's a very difficult thing to do because yes. the majority of people are going to be very, very challenged by you living in harmony with truth. And that's the reason why you don't want to do it. Mm. Most people are so afraid of living in harmony with truth. And that's the reason why when they come to their fear wall, they run away and tell themselves a whole heap of lies doing so. Yep. Because, because it's preferable than telling themselves the truth to go through their fear and then finding out that all the things they were afraid of actually happened. Mm -hmm. Like they are now getting attacked by their family and their mm -hmm. friends mm -hmm. and, and you know, they lost their job because of this particular reason and that particular reason. Their life's falling apart now. Like potentially that's what they feel. It's not yep. true, but that's what they believe. Their life will fall apart now if they fully engage the truth and they fully engage living in harmony with all of their emotions all the time. They believe that they're going to, you know, create a huge mess. And so mm -hmm. they hit that wall and run away. Yeah, and you talked about this in a talk that you gave at an assistance group in Texas last year in 2013, mm -hmm. something that has been very powerful for me working through, and that is um, dealing with the sense of hopelessness that many of us experience as a child because there was no way Hope, out. As a child. There was no way of getting those emotions out and feeling better or there was no yeah. way to avoid yeah. a continual situation where we didn't feel like... Well, the sad thing for most children is this. 
they had some kind of negative emotion projected at them from their parent. Mm -hmm. They usually probably tried to cry about it initially. Mm -hmm. They were told they'd get more violence if they cried. Yeah. Generally, that's yeah. the case. Now we've got a problem. Now the parent has shut down not only the emotional experience from the first emotion, but has also told them that they will get more violent reaction from the parent mm -hmm. if they cry about the first one. Now that's an injustice upon an injustice. Yes. That's yes. the sad thing and most of us have experienced it. Now once we've experienced that, we feel like, what's the point? Like, mm -hmm. I can't even cry about how I've been treated, let alone feel about how I've been treated yeah. and how bad that was. Yeah. I can't even cry about it anymore. Yeah. And I'm treated as if that's bad as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, many of us are going to get to the wall of fear and realise that actually it's, it's a lot about feelings of hopelessness and despair. So there's and no point there's moving no through point emotion. moving through it. Because it's all, it's this childhood experience of feeling very restricted. Yes. And that even when I cry, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen again, which is really... And most of the time when we were a child, if we did cry, it, it did happen worse, again. Worse, yes. Or it even was worse. Yes. So this is our problem as a child is we go, oh, it's worse if I cried, so I've got to turn off crying. And then we finish up growing up saying, uh, I'm not I'm emotional. I'm not that emotional. I'm yeah. not that emotional. And then we wonder why. Yeah. Because, of course, you've been shut down terribly. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. So you need to allow yourself to feel about that. And <clears> to <throat> feel, for myself, feeling that sense of hopelessness has not only helped, assisted me with desire, and you were talking about having a purpose, having a, something that will cause us to want to move through fear. Mm. And for myself, experiencing some of that emotion has enabled me to re-establish desires for mm. God and for you and for even myself and to mm. be happy. Mm. But um, I suppose I'm sharing that just by way of encouragement to people who are, mm. who are sitting camped out in front of that wall of fear, feeling yuck but not really just connecting to the reasons why they feel so hopeless. Yeah, about. so I, I feel this wall of fear, though. Most people don't camp out in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's just me. I camped Mate, out for you, a while. You have, but yeah. most of the people will don't. You know, they get to it, they even just look at it and they go, ah! <laughs> and, <off laughs> and they then go. They go. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> they're just gone. And, uh, and then they use all sorts of justification, anger and all sorts of other things to justify, and usually condescension, belittling, you know, all sorts of justification about the popular way. Yeah. as though, no, that's not the way and all that kind of stuff, to tell themselves, and it's all just an avoidance of their terror, that's mm -hmm. all it is. Mm -hmm. And they tell themselves all sorts of things in that place. Like we've had many, many people tell themselves all sorts of things, as you know. Yeah. And you know how hard it is to sit in front of that terror and not, and just sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there without any addictions anymore yeah. to help you cover them over. That, that's it's quite, pretty painful. It's a pretty painful place. And, and, you know, it's taken a bit of encouragement from myself and, and also discussion with each other about the truth about God, like yeah. that God wants you through this place, yeah. that you can trust God through this place, that you can have faith that this is how your soul was made through this place mm -hmm. and that things will get better through this place and then you've had a few experiences of your own which have, which have caused your life to get better yeah. and then you realise, wow, yes, I can trust all of that. And then you start moving through that barrier mm -hmm. of fear. Mm -hmm. but, but the majority of people don't do that. They don't sit in front of their fear long enough to mm. do that. Mm. They, they get to their fear and off they go. And for, for many on the path, they haven't even got to their fear yet because they're still steeped in their yeah, addictions, addictions. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I not even that. honest about what those addictions are. Yeah. And so, so they never get to see their fear, of course. Yeah. And... and this is the trouble with all these self-deceptions is that we never get to our addictions, we never get to our fears. How can you ever get to your real causal emotional pain that's, that's causing most of your unloving behaviour if you're unwilling to even deal with your addictions or your fears? The answer is you can't. No. And, and so my suggestion to a person is if they feel stuck, wherever they feel stuck, so they might feel stuck and acknowledging their addictions. Mm -hmm. Just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> feel that place and how, you know, pointless it feels and how, how much of a struggle it feels and feel that place. And at some point in your future, you will decide, I want to get through this place. I don't want to go back to the life I had before. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be steeped in these addictions that cause me to be unloving. 
I want to get through and be a more loving person and eventually your desire will build strong, strong enough if you allow it yeah. and if you actively exercise the muscle of desire, which yes. we'll talk about more in the coming assistance groups, and you will actually eventually have enough will to go, yes, I want to feel my addictions, I want to know what they are, I want to work through them. I want to get to the point where I'm face to face with my fear. <laughs> and then once we're face to face with our fear and we're just sitting there terrified looking <laughs> yeah. at this mountain of fear that we feel in front of us and bear in mind that it looks like a mountain because everyone who's terrified always thinks it's a mountain. Yeah. And, and we stay there in that place until we have a strong enough desire to actually start processing it, to actually feel it as an emotion and let it go. And yeah. then we get through with that. And then we get through our fear. That's how we get through yeah. our fear. And, and a lot of that is working through the false beliefs we have about fear even, isn't it? The, and yeah. those, those things I was referring to, the hopelessness. We have hundreds of false judgment. beliefs. So, there's so much, fear, so much judgment about fear on the planet as well, I feel. Not only just judgment. It's like false beliefs other than judgment exist. You yeah. know, like there's so much fal just false justification of I shouldn't have to go through it. It's not safe for me to go through it. Yeah. I'm going to be worse if I go through it. There's all sorts of things we tell ourselves and most people are telling themselves those things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, of course, they never get through it, mm -mm. right? Because they, they're listening to their own lies, yeah. right? God doesn't believe that you can't go through fear. God doesn't believe that it's pointless. God doesn't believe that afterwards you're going to be, you know, in some like weird state that you don't know, you know, you're going to be better. You well, know. it will be weird because you've never felt so good. <laughs> well, it might, it, it, but It'll it won't be... be weird in the sense of, you know, it won't, it won't be a sad place no. or, a, a, or, or a bizarre a, place. A bizarre place. Yeah. It's actually a place where you feel more desire, more passion in your life, more happiness, more joy. So, mm -hmm. so if we're not feeling those things on the path and if we're stuck, then it's because we are usually justifying ourselves not progressing forward yeah. and the only reason why you wouldn't progress forward is because you're afraid mm. so you really need to start facing what that wall of fear is mm -hmm. if you're really going to progress and if you haven't even touched your addictions yet you're never going to see it no because your addictions are there to cover it all over yeah. it's like it's like putting up a huge concrete wall and then putting a big you know ivy over it or something you know some plant over it so you can't see it that's yeah. what we've done with our fear most of us we go oh isn't this environment so pretty but i can't move in that direction because there's a solid wall there but i oh, it's not a wall it's just a lovely ivy you know it's a <laughs> lovely plant that covers it all over you know <laughs> and yeah. that's how we see our fear we, we most of us are in complete denial of it because we want our addictions met and we're not honest about that and once we get through that place where we actually want our addictions and we want to see our addictions, see what they are, feel what they are, then we come face to face with our wall of fear. And the key at that point is don't run away. Because <laughs> if you run away, you're going to do a lot of damaging things when you run away. You will because you'll be living in your fear. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a very wise course of action to run away. You're better off taking up camp and sitting there <laughs> than you are running away. And even better than that would be start examining all your beliefs about fear. Yeah. And, and, and accepting God's beliefs about them. And the only way to accept God's beliefs about them is to emotionally connect, emotionally connect to our beliefs about fear. Correct. In my experience. Correct. We, it's all fine to have a discussion about it. Yep. But until we just really emotionally connect with what we believe is going to happen when we feel fear, that's the only time we make space for God's truth to enter us. That's right. And, and motivate us towards actually releasing fear. That's right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So, so for, for um, I don't know the lady's name. It, was there, there was no name. There was no name. So for this lady who asked this question, and I feel lots and lots of people are in this state, my suggestion is if you notice now that you're in emotions of self-deception, that's great mm -hmm. because you've now told, see, oh, I've been fooling myself, and that's really good to see that. It is. But, but look at the reasons why, and the reasons primarily why are that you do not want to face the addictions that you have because you don't want to let them go. And if you're ever going to progress forward, you're going to have to face them to let them go. Yeah. Or you do not want to face the fears you have and you don't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to progress forward, you're going to have to let them go. That means you're going to have to face them at some point. So what I would suggest for the people in this position is that they allow themselves to examine their addictions more completely. Mm -hmm. 
and they also are more honest with, they need to be more honest with themselves about their addictions. And then also, in addition to that, they need to allow themselves to come face to face with their wall of fear. And instead of running away and instead of using techniques to run away like they always have all the way through their life, they need to be far more honest with themselves and allow themselves to just sit there and feel it for a while and feel how terrified they are yeah. and allow themselves to work through their false beliefs about fear. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have any false beliefs about fear. Mm -mm. God knows it's just an emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sonny. No worries. Mm -hmm.